At AIA Australia, we have the tools and support to help you grow your business. Available 24-7, our Business Growth Hub offers an online suite of resources such as marketing tools and help to build out your health and wellbeing proposition. If you're looking for a trusted business partner, chat to your AIA CDM today. Well, welcome everybody uh, to the Woo! XY Live Forum for this week. Uh, big thanks to our mates at AIA for producing such a fantastic commercial that's uh, uh, the reason for we're three minutes behind, but uh, uh, <laughs> educational material, Ben. Yes, and very relevant because today we're talking all about education um, and whether a degree is enough. So we are joined by financial advice royalty today. Um, Woo! But, uh, everyone is ex ex as excited as I am. Nick Hakes from the AFA has, has kindly offered to to join uh, the panel, and we've also got. Adrian Patty, Phil Thompson, the lovely Naomi a Midwinter, I was going to say. Is that your surname? No. Christopher. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, nice plug. Yes. Hashtag ad. Uh, <laughs> and the birthday boy himself, uh, also known as Clayton Daniel, but like getting older and wiser. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Great to have you all on the line. Uh, and today we're talking, is a degree enough? So... Um, I was having a chat, this session came about, I was having a chat with Nick uh, the other week about, you know, some of the changes that are happening in, in relation to education standards. And I was pretty surprised by the conversation. There was a lot of stuff in there that, that I uh, wasn't aware of. So um, I'm keen to just start the session with just getting a, a bit of a background from Nick in terms of, you know, what are the changes that are happening and what does this all mean for advisors? So Nick, welcome. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, I was going to wear my designer T-shirt, but um, I just settled for a, a shirt and jacket, so I, I hope that's cool. <laughs> and is. a white designer T-shirt, too. 20 bucks, general pants, all over it. Um, I've got 10 of them. Nice work. <laughs> So it's interesting, education has been a theme and a topic of conversation for the last couple of years. And it's come at the end of what I think everybody would agree has been a pretty tumultuous little period of a couple of years since the very end of the GFC. And, uh, and so this conversation around education and professional standards has been rolling through the marketplace. And I think, I don't know about you guys, but there's a little bit of reform fatigue. And so it just seems that are people really grabbing onto the detail as to what potentially it means to them. But we've had a recent uh, progress and which will hopefully deliver certainty for us all. And that is with the formation of the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority. So they're like the standard setting body that has to make a whole lot of decisions uh, to give us certainty as to how higher education and professional standards are actually going to impact us. And it's my view that, uh, and, I, and I take this from uh, the, the silent pulse of the marketplace. I feel very humbled and very privileged in that I do get to travel around the country and I do get to talk to a whole cross section of different advisors and advice businesses uh, all across the country and regional and metro areas and different licensees. And I reckon there's such thing as a, a silent pulse of the marketplace. And the silent pulse and the feedback that we're getting from AFA members and practitioners is that um, people want to embrace higher education and professional standards. So philosophically, everybody's on board. They're a little bit reform fatigued. And so they just want to create some certainty as to what they have to do so they can get back to the really important thing about sitting in front of their clients and growing the demand of financial advice. And so we've had, you know, the, the FASIA board uh, being established and essentially there's five key elements of the legislation. And if I could just put the key message up front before we get into a whole lot of detail and conversation is that uh, everyone on the line take some self-interest and some self-responsibility to understand these five elements, which are um, a degree entry into our profession. Uh, if you're an existing advisor, it's a degree equivalent. We can talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's a professional year, 
really relevant for new entrants into our profession. There's a registration exam for all of us. There is, uh, everyone needs to sign up to a code compliance monitoring scheme, a code of ethics. And the last one is there's going to be a standardization of continuous professional development. So they're the five elements. They're all interdependent of each other. So I think that's kind of this, this uh, fabric that we're interweaving of all of those five elements. And my personal view is that the potential impact and consequences to financial advisors and financial advice businesses over the next, you know, seven years, um, it can be quite significant. So this is something which everybody needs to really understand how it impacts them. Awesome. And so just to, to dive into a couple of those points, um, I, and I'm keen to hear from the other guys on the line. So, you know, this degree standard is something that's been, been spoken about for a while. Personally, I think that's a, a fantastic idea because I think there should be some barriers to entry uh, for the profession. But at the same time, I, I feel like it's not, not going to mean real change, I think, meaningful change in the industry. So, uh, I'm keen to, to sort of go around and, and hear from the other guys as to, you know, their thoughts on is a degree enough? Tomo, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, so the, the subject is, is a degree enough. I don't think, you know, a piece of paper is really going to do, you know, much. I think, you know, doing a, increasing it from a four-week course that you can easily sign up for and just smash out with a diploma to a three-year degree is is obviously a you know an improvement um, because barriers to entry are way too low at the moment, um, but you, you know the, the, there are plenty of nuffers with with heaps of degrees. Um, so I mean I've got a degree in circus arts, so you know there, there you go. The degree is not necessarily the the most important thing. Is that is that an aligned? Is is that is that an accepted uh, major, mate? To get <laughs> <Yeah. plenty? laughs> no, no. probably is. <laughs> I always yeah, thought you were a bit better, but now I know, now I know uh, you're a professional, so uh, <laughs> good. But yeah, it's a good point. And, uh, and that's, I was chatting to Ray earlier today, who uh, is laid up in bed at the moment. He was very upset to not be able to join uh, in on this conversation because uh, he's, he's really passionate about education. He's currently doing a, a psychology degree uh, to, to assist him in the work that he's doing with his clients. And, um, yeah, I think that's a question. Like, what's what sort of degree? Is it a finance degree? Is it a psychology degree? Or, or what's the structure? What do you think, Patty? Well, like, I've got a master's. And what does, Ooh. like, <laughs> um, most people that know me, does that necessarily dictate that you're good at certain things? Not really. Um, <laughs> it's The correlation isn't there. And I think, um, like, it's... I think you've got it's a it's a good tool, as Ben said, to sort of barrage entry. Uh, it's a good benchmark to set. But if we're talking about being effective, I think there's it's a whole other discussion that goes on besides just simply a degree, because there's so many bloody good advisors out there that maybe just have the diploma, and uh, I just yeah, there's, I just don't see the correlation. So. I, I think it's it's something that we're working with because it's it's a it's a tool that we can use to to um, put a bit of a filter and a, a benchmark to the industry and and most people should be able to achieve that but to to think that it's actually going to dictate the quality of advice um, I, I think that's another that's another discussion. Let me this is let me grab this and put it back to you right because. Patty, both you and uh, Tomo have both said, um, what makes you a good advisor? And there seems to be this thing that we often do where we equate <clears throat> like a degree and we say, well, therefore, I become a good advisor and, and therefore I deliver great <coughs> advice. And I think we're missing an element in there about actually where does, where does that greatness come from? So what, wh how do you accelerate expertise? Because... I'm guessing everyone would be happy to say, look, you can't just walk out of university, sit in front of a client and be a great advisor or deliver great advice. And so you have to accelerate expertise somewhere, right? It comes from some experience and it comes from uh, um, learning the craft. And it's not until you've had some difficult client conversations and you've had some 
um, some successes in seeing the value of your advice deliver really great financial outcomes and personal outcomes. And probably you learn from also seeing how your advice might've been great and sound and technical, but it actually didn't deliver the outcome that you thought it would because maybe the client didn't truly understand and act on the advice. So this experience um, and expertise discussion is a really important one. Um, and, and so maybe we often just equate having a degree in formal education will therefore make a great advisor. And you guys just highlighted something that says, well, maybe, maybe there's a missing element there. Yeah. And I think that's a, a really good point that, um, you know, it's, it's clearly not the, the, the only solution. You can't just come straight out of uni. Uh, but so, yeah, keen, keen to hear from the other guys. Naomi, you obviously see a lot of different businesses in the, in the work that you do with Midwinter. So what do, you, what do you see that the really good practices, the ones that are excelling, that have great relationships with their clients, that are kicking butt um, in, in their business, what are they doing differently to, or better than uh, the other advisors, would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, in relation to this topic in particular, I think um, it's not the the businesses that are kicking butt. Um, it isn't necessarily linked to the fact that they've had, you know, they've gone and done a degree. Uh, um, I think especially a lot of the advisors that have been around and have gone through like the school of hard knocks and, um, and as Nick was saying, you know, had a couple of experiences with clients, really know... Um, that EQ side of how to deal with clients and um, and uh, on the job experience is actually what makes them great advisors. Uh, and I, and I, that uh, job, like on the job experience, cannot be um, like underrated. Like it cannot be overrated enough. It's it's. I think that's an integral part of of what makes them stand out as an advisor. Um, and not just. I, I mean, if we look at that broadly. Uh, in any industry. I mean, I, when I came straight out of uni, that's not what made me um, a marketing success. Like I had to learn things on like in my first role and go through an investigation process and fail a couple of times and see what works and see what doesn't. And I think that's, that's probably where the benchmark is. Um, so I think that the degree thing is, um, you know, if I went for any job right now, they wouldn't accept me unless I've had a degree in my relative field. Um, I don't think it's because I learned everything I needed to know in my degree. I'd actually say the opposite, but uh, I think it helps to build trust and um, the advice industry is struggling a lot with trying to build trust with consumers. And perhaps that's, that's one of the elements that will help um, knowing that uh, your clients know that you haven't done just done a four week course and bang straight into it. Um, you've actually gone to the effort of having a formal education process, whatever that is. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think it, that does go a long way to, to doing trust. But, you know, as you touched on, I did, I, I've got a, a few degrees now, but when I did my bachelor degree, uh, I did commerce, which is all, you know, very much related, you would think, to financial advice. But I used a very small percentage of the stuff that I learned in my commerce degree in the work that I did. Like the economic principles helped with the conversations with clients. But beyond that, the there was little value and most of the stuff that I learned as an advisor has all been on the job and, and doing it in practice and then doing further research and study. Um, mm. But I just want to go into one of the other points that you mentioned there on, on emotional intelligence. Now this uh, may seem like a bit of a loaded question, Clay, but how important is emotional intelligence? Um, yeah, well, so ducking very quickly into the university, I, I, I think, um, I think it, it can't, it's not a bad thing. Like things can only go up if, if we take it on. I think it's a great first step. But I think mirroring your thoughts just then, uh, one can only learn so much through books. And it's the, it, you know, I've had over a thousand meetings with, with people to talk about their, me about their money. And that's crazy, right? O over like a decade career. And then uh, there, you know, what I thought financial advice was, and I thought sort of this personal finance space was, it, it, it isn't. It, it, what I thought it was balance sheets, but it's actually coaching and, it, it, and it's personifying engagement with their own outcome 
uh, for the client and then directing that relationship into the money. And so the person goes, okay, I don't really care about all this, but I care about my relationship with you and you're telling me to do this and I respect you, therefore I'll do it. And then you get the outcome. Um, and that's, and that's all EQ. So a hundred percent of, of that. So to answer your question, it's paramount to the job, but I would say that entry to the ballpark or entry to the game comes with the ticket that says, I know the numbers. So you mm. get the numbers, you get the ticket, you're allowed to, you're allowed on the field. And then it's that experience and that EQ that actually turns you into a good advisor. And I'm sure that there are good advisors without that information, that backing, but, um, and, but that's not really where we want to go. We kind of want to go with the education as a must have and, and then, and then let's be good at our jobs. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Hey, see, I'm going to, I'm going to throw to you now so you can, you can come in with that. But I, I understand from, uh, from our previous conversation that you've got a few stats around, you know, what is important to clients from the research that you guys have done. So perhaps you can touch on that. Yeah, so we undertake a, a number of different white papers and pieces of research. In 2013, uh, we did a white paper um, uh, with, with Beddoes and also Zurich called the, the Trusted Advisor. And this was going to um, the clients of advisors and asking them what they valued the most out of the relationship with financial advice. And this is startling, right? 82% rated the interpersonal communication, um, the care, empathy, the deep understanding of what actually truly mattered to, to them, the client, as the number one quality. Yeah. Distant second, third, like by miles was things like, um, you know, professional conduct, um, technical skills. Like that is a ticket to the game. And I think from my perspective anyway, that this conversation isn't discounting the need to know your stuff, right? Because if you don't know your stuff, technically it can have some massive consequences to people's financial situation. So this is not about discounting it, but this is just recognizing that the clients of advisors through evidence in said overwhelmingly the quality that they liked the most was that interpersonal, the care, the empathy, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. And, and yet we have a, an education pathway that only focuses on the technical skills and doesn't really pay any attention to the interpersonal and the communication skills. Yeah, the, a, a good point. And <coughs> just to touch, just to touch on, uh, a real life example of, of uh, you know, the, some of those stats. Clearly, uh, professional conduct is not the most important thing to advisors, uh, which is pr pretty much the main reason why uh, Adrian Patty is still in business. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm keen to just ask you guys, though, uh, in all seriousness, like, what what's the best um, professional development education you've done in the last 12 months? I'll throw to you first, Phil. All right, mate, you give us a, a big curly one and you, you throw it straight to me. Um, so the best professional development um, that I've done in the last 12 months, is that, was that the question? Yeah, yeah, the best. It doesn't have to be a formal thing, but the best stuff that you've learned in the last 12 months that's helped you in your advice work or your business. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of ongoing education, self-education and like constant learning. And I mean, you know, XY Advisor, Facebook group is a perfect example. You know, every day people are throwing out questions on, you know, just tax questions, insurance questions, you know, just getting constant feedback from other advisors. And um, so, so I'm a massive fan of, of that as a form of education. Um, and it can be, can be more powerful than formal education. Um, so, but the best, um, bit of education that I've received in the last 12 months has probably been, um, I, you know, shameless plug, but these, these X, Y lives, just talking to other advisors about what they're doing, how they're doing it, how, how can I improve my business? How can I improve my you know, customer experience? How can, you know, I've focused my business solely around what it is that they exactly need. Uh, that's probably been the best education, um, technical stuff. You know, it's, it's kind of, 
you, sh- you should know that stuff or know where to find out that stuff when you're providing technical advice. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I guess that's my answer. Agreed. Paddy? Yeah, I, I'd mirror what um, Phil is saying. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's not, the learnings that I've had over the last few months have definitely not been uh, formal learnings, that's for sure. Um, the, the peer side of things is just huge. Like, absolutely huge. Like, you're, I know, Ben, you're, you're probably the best, one of the best, well, you're the best example I know of someone that's benefited from really good mentorship. And, and that's, that's sort of the one-on-one space. And I've, I've never been that good at sort of um, getting those set up. But I, I really, I've really enjoyed the peer mentorship. So, like, just for example, like, every time I, I do chat to Ben, we'll, we'll share what we're doing in our business. And that is, that's, just invaluable whenever like I've got something to give him, he's got something to give me and that's what's going on in XY live every day. And I think that was, that was probably one of the biggest drivers for like XY buys are really kicking off because we all knew how much we value we got from each other. And we realized not all advisors were in that position to do that or benefiting from that. So we just, we promoted it. Um, I've got to do that tax advisor thing, Nick. Um, a sort of, I've still done that transition piece. Was that supposed to be the 30th of, before the 30th of June? No, yeah. I managed to sort of, sure. it's really, it's a little bit complex. I managed to sort of squeeze into the bit where I can still be transitioning and not have to have the degree, I think I get it. I right. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, buddy. And look, a, um, a, a shameless plug for the AFA in that, as you mentioned, you know, one of the, um, the, I got hooked up with a mentor through the AFA's mentoring program. It helped me uh, incredibly in my business and we're now in business together. Um, and, you know, I think that's the whole the reason that drove us to actually start XY Advisor in the start because, um, you know, everyone was just learning so much from each other that, um, you know, we wanted to, to, to take that out. And that's, that's where the best stuff comes from. Clay, yeah. best learnings <laughs> last 12 months? Yeah, um, two things. So uh, this is a bit of a plug as well. A key person of influence. I learn a lot through them, um, which I know a couple of us have done. And um, and also sort of transitioning into the product side uh, rather than service side of financial advice. Um, and just that jumping, he- you know, f- just head first into it is, uh, is forcing me to learn a lot. So Half my days are, um, are speaking about tech. The other half is talking to venture capitalists. And it's really just that piece, that, that, that peer learning thing that we're talking about here. So I, I think it's just, you know, I did a degree and everything and I've done upskilling with Kaplan and Pinnacle and all that sort of stuff. And it, you barely learn anything, but you talk to people um and then all of a sudden you learn because they're speaking your language so yeah I, i'm a, i'm just massive sit down chat about something with someone yeah very very informal but those two things are massive cool. so maybe let me uh let me put that into some academic uh context for what you guys have just said um there's a whole lot of debate about this thing called the Australian qualification framework, right? And, and what level do people's AQ qualifications sit at? And no doubt we need to increase the barrier to entry and a degree is really great. So it goes up to this, you know, AQF level seven degree, bachelor degree. But what that's really about is about these um, teaching you how to think. How do you critically yeah. analyze something? Like how do you unpack? And yeah. so the actual data stuff, you know, is less relevant, but it's the mindset uh, that it can yeah. teach you to uncover complex problems. Yeah. And so, so that's good, right? That's a skill. But then the bit we're talking about here is the skill and the art of the communication and interpersonal. And how do you actually really get to the problem that your client hasn't really shared with you because it's this deep seated emotional one and they have never verbalized what is their fear or apprehension. Them. They're just telling you, I think that I want to buy a house or I think I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I want to save and we're going to have a kid and a family and, and, but what's lies underneath. Now, um, this concept of peer learning, uh, you know, the, the AFA, right? Just that's where I got a lot of my peer learning from and, 
we call them communities of practice now. And I would argue that XY, XY Advisor is a community of practice. So what's that about? It's about the best learning comes from your peers. And so our whole education philosophy is built upon advisors are the best people to solve their own challenges and grab their own opportunity because it is you who are closest to the client conversation. Mm. And so if we can create these um, responsibilities or this, this uh, culture within our profession for all practitioners to be intellectually curious and go and get the technical bit that they need to solve a particular problem, but then be intellectually curious to go and hang out with their peers and participate in communities of practice and participate in peer learning, then that can only be a good thing, right? I feel like Nick, you completely ruined my 10 minute segue into my next question because the, um, what I was keen to chat about having heard what, um, what everyone valued most uh, on like in the last 12 months for their education. Um, I didn't hear anyone say that it was uh, the, the, the sort of stuff that we are expected to do for our continuing professional development. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that that's one of the five pillars of the, of the standards that they're considering changing. And, um, you know, given that we're saying that the best learning, so learning from peers informally, learning from uh, structured programs, which are some, a little outside of the technical space, um, you know, wh where does that fit with this whole continuing professional development framework? You're asking me or these guys? I'm asking you. You, you Hexy. Right. Big target on you, buddy. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have an opportunity right at the moment through the formation of FASIA, and we've got these five elements which are all interdependent of each other to really have a rethink as to what it is we want our profession to learn and to put into practice. And if I can relay a story as to, to answer your question about, you know, pro continuous professional development. So I was very fortunate that uh, a university asked me to go and do a guest lecture at the end of a semester. And, and so uh, I went in there and there were about 60 students who were you know, enrolled into this unit of financial planning. And, and so I started, I've got, so who wants to be a financial advisor? three people put their hand up. I'm going, <laughs> I'm lucky though I asked that at the start of the lecture and not the end, because if it was the end, they probably thought it was like, you know, my terrible presentation. <laughs> and they had a quiz, right? Where they were testing some technical stuff and it was really hard. Um, and it was, you know, really good stuff technically. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, man, there's something wrong with this, that people chose to enroll into this unit. Yet only three out of 60 wanted to become what they were learning. Mm. It's crazy. And so if we say, well, how do we accelerate expertise to make it like you guys, really great advisors, then maybe instead of taking this concept of communication and problem solving, and, and you know, how to discover the real underlying problems with clients, maybe we should formalize that in the curriculum of universities. And so then when they come out the other end, they actually have skilled in the, in the art and the craft of, of interacting with clients, and then they do their professional year, and so they can practice it in a peer learning environment with a mentor. And then we finally give them a badge and we go, right, congratulations you are now a financial advisor when it comes to learning continuous professional development we've already started them you know on the journey of wanting to find out more and get better at communication and and interpersonal skills um, and so yeah currently the way in which CPD is currently constructed um, links all the way back to FSR and you have these concepts like superannuation and insurance and retirement products and tax. And these are all fundamentally important around providing advice, but they all link back to product descriptions, right? And yet yeah. 
Products are super, super important because if we didn't have insurance products, we'd have a problem. So they're good. But in terms of our continuous professional development, I don't know about you guys, but all the PD days that I go to in conferences, I thoroughly enjoy how it makes me better at what I do. And we should embed some of the stuff on <laughs> interpersonal relationship skills in continuous professional development. But how we get there is we've got to start it from the very, very start. Just to follow up on that, what professional development days do you go to that, that, in, that you enjoy? Which ones are uh, they? My most, my most favourite are XY Advisor ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then closely followed by the AFA professional <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, so question, question for the group. Like, can soft skills be learned, Naomi? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, it does come naturally to, to some people more than others, of course. Um, and, <laughs> uh, but I, th I think uh, it, it can be learned, perhaps not formally, perhaps that these are the things that you learn on the job or, I mean, going back a little bit on, on what people were talking about before and what they've found to be their, you know, the, their best learning um, in the last 12 months. Uh, a, a lot of these things you can learn from observing other people. Uh, you can't put a, a price on hanging out with people who know more than you, you know? So uh, soft, soft skills, 100%, uh, just watch, observe, watch someone who's great at it and, um, and learn. And, and yeah, it, you know, um, it's not something that you get straight away, but it, it ends up being the most, some, in some ways, the most important part of your relationship with your clients. So. Yeah, cool. Clay, how do you think we can best learn soft skills? Oh man, this is, it's one thing that we did in Horizons, which was uh, sort of a, an accelerator to become a, an advisor, was um, we did days uh, of having interviews with clients, but they were actors, and you were filmed, and um, and then you know, people, mentors or whatever were actually watching what you were doing um, on replay. And you could sort of look at the way that you interacted. Um, it was a little bit fake, right? Because you got a camera in your, in your mug. So you like act a little bit different. But it was a good, it was, I think it was good to see how, you know, it, that's at least one way. Um, how you would facilitate that, I've got absolutely no idea. Um, but of course, just the classic getting involved and getting your hands dirty you know, like some of the best stuff I've ever learned was just silly mistakes I made with clients. Like in the early days when I was making meetings, I'd be like, oh, come in and bring your tax file number, right? And we, we can get, we, you know, because with your tax file number, you can get all the super funds, you know exactly what's going on. Um, they can leave a lot of their shit at home um, and you can literally just research it all. Um, but that is freaky. If you say to someone, come in and bring your tax file number, <clears throat> the person looked at me in the face and they said, I thought you were a scam because the only thing I asked them to bring was their tax file number. And so they literally turned up because they thought I was some scam artist. And I'm like, really? Like I'm thinking so rationally here and trying to do everything really efficiently, but you think I'm, you think I'm a scam artist. So then that taught me, right. So don't, you know, don't get down to business. Um, do the whole, you know, create the relationship again, personify engagement. Um, it, it's really just, you know, you don't meet someone and say, do you want to have a child? You meet someone and go, do you want to grab a drink? Right? Like it, it's none of that's new to any part of life. So yeah, outside of potentially organizing a situation where you can film yourself and watch and critique it with, um, with coaches, it's nothing too special. Just get your hands dirty and have meetings. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, sometimes you do just have to make those mistakes and learn. I know that uh, I learned a few very valuable lessons the hard way, uh, helping people with their personal insurance. I remember, still remember the first application that I did when I was doing an e app and asking the people the questions. Uh, big mistake, especially when it gets to all the like the sexual activity and. Uh, yeah. lovely, like lovely, this lovely couple in their mid fifties. Uh, that was the first and last time I read out the question. Uh, I've also learned similarly valuable lessons from uh, doing insurance for females and having uh, conversations about uh, health preferences and their weight. Uh, I 
I steer very well clear of that and uh, try to just nod my head when they give me their responses. So uh, I think you're 100% right that you do just have to get your hands dirty. Patty, your thoughts? Any uh, soft skills tips? Um, I think I think what everyone's saying is you just got to yeah, as you're saying, get your hands dirty. One thing one thing we were starting to do, um, I and over the last year and a bit, I've had my offsider or support person being in the meetings with me is starting to get them to do parts of the meeting, and uh, I think I guess one one aspect that comes out with that is just sort of. If we're talking about how people are actually going to get to that stage and get that experience, it's sort of um, it's looking at how protective and and how the advisors that have that experience pass it on, because it essentially comes down to if we're saying that these people that have been doing it are the ones that actually have all the gold to pass on and share, then if they're not sharing, then nothing that key educational bit's not happening. And as much as XY Advisor shares all this great stuff, um, a lot of us have learnt the hard way, I'd argue, like Clayton, Ben and myself definitely, and Phil I'm sure as well, um, and Naomi in her own field. But does it actually have to be that challenging? Is that the, is that the most effective way to get people upskilled into being an advisor? And I'd argue that um, a redesign of the way a lot of people pass sort of uh, – that information, that gold that they have on to the next generation of advisors is probably a real um, crucial dimension. Completely and agree. Tomo, awesome. final thoughts, and then I'm coming to you, Hagsy, but I don't want you to ruin this segue as well, so just chill. Yeah, okay. So my, my thought, I don't want to kind of go on a, on a too big a tangent, but continued professional development is kind of a, an, an odd term because um, if we're talking about these soft skills, that, that will help us continue to be professional. Um, but doing CBD points is all just about continuing to hold your license. That's really what it is. And then, and our license is all about recommending products. So to do CBDs that is anything but product related is kind of against what our license is for. So it's, for me, it's just continued professional development should be all about, um, you know, soft skills and all of these things that actually make up our, what we do, but to continue to hold a license and ASICs requirements for that, it kind of needs to be product based as much as I don't like it as much as, you know, I prefer just to do all soft skills, no product stuff. That's what our license allows us to do, you know, recommend products. Um, and so to move away from that is going to be a hard ask to say to ASIC, Hey, even though our license says we only do products, but just let us learn about soft skills. Yeah, it's a good point you make. Uh, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, obviously the, the product stuff is critical. Like you can't get that wrong. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, because that's that's what leads to issues with clients. But at the same time, if you've got just that, then you, and without this, you know, emotional intelligence, soft skills piece, then you can't effectively coach clients. And I know, uh, you know, when I started working in advice, it was, I would uh, help people build awesome financial plans with great strategies, but they, they got average results because I wasn't as effective in coaching them. Um, so, you know, agree completely that the legislation is product based that the learning is um the cpd is product based but you know there i feel like there should be some more um balance there but just sort of tailing on to that nick because i know we were chatting and, and you were telling me about an interesting approach that some different uh different professions were taking to how they actually teach people soft skills so do you want to just uh yeah give us some insight as to what other people are doing in this space yeah sure so to get there, just this concept of you guys all said, you know, jump in and get your hands dirty to learn how to do it. And the question that I think of and, and I'd put back to you is, did you say that is because that's the only way that you experienced it? Mm. And so maybe there is another way, right? And this inflection point as to where we are and the role of Fazia is maybe we could do it another way and we could rethink and redefine financial advisor. And so we embedded the what, how to learn formally and we embedded it to create scale at the start of the learning process for financial advice. Because at the moment, we kind of just throw it in and it's a little bit ad hoc, yet everybody says it's the most important thing. It's nuts. Yeah. And, and maybe to Phil's point about... Uh, it's really important to know product and changes in the technical landscape. 
Yeah, it is, right? Because if you're out of date, you can have some disastrous effects. But why does it have to be one or the other? Why couldn't we have both? And I think, you know, rethinking, redefining. And so to answer your question as to parallel sectors, we keep on having conversations about um, how our emerging profession plays such an important role in managing and predicting clients' behaviours. Because that's what it's about, right? Financial advice is about managing and predicting clients' behaviours. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting, I learned this from uh, Dr. Adam Tucker, who's with the Beddoes Institute, and he's running this piece of research that we've got in the market at the moment. He relayed to me that when he was entering into his medical profession, he spent like the barriers to entry are like really high, right? You've got to go to degrees and more degrees. But he related the story about how they formally learn this, this uh, how to take the patient's history. And what he explained that to be was 80% um, of a diagnosis comes from the patient themselves. And then by listening and kind of un winding the onion you get to the you know root of the, the the problem and then then you can send the patient off for tests and mri mris and x-rays and all that sort of stuff and then you apply professional judgment to make a recommendation but it's that learning of taking the patient's history the communication that's formally embedded and we don't do that and i'll give you another parallel a couple of years ago um Graham Rich from Portfolio Construction Forum bought out Dr. David Lazenby, right, as his chief phenology officer. And D Dr. David Lazenby was a financial advisor and he was a psychologist. And he goes, in the psychology discipline, there's like six different types of silence. What? When you ask a question of a client, and I know, Clan, you're going to struggle with this one, but how often, <laughs> how often, do we ask a question and we pause and we just wait for the other person to tell their answer. And then we go, Oh, by the way, so what I was going to tell you was, but that's not where the art comes from, right? It's like, how do you kind of get people to really share their emotional drivers? And I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel in this stuff. I reckon it already exists. We just need to go to other disciplines that are already doing it and pinch all the good stuff. And we just need to put it, formalize it so we can create scale and so maybe in 10 years time when whoever's cooler than xy right now is having this webinar they say things <laughs> like um you know when i learned this right right from the very start um you know that'll be that'll be said why i think they're uh, they're coming <laughs> yeah maybe maybe we're over the hill. <laughs> yeah that's it because i'm keen to just right? um uh, to, to chat about this professional year, uh, which, you know, I'm hearing a lot from the, from this conversation, <laughs> the value of learning from mentors, uh, learning experience, learning on the job. So uh, before we get into what's being proposed and how it's going to work, I'm just keen to hear from everyone on what they think the ideal professional year uh, would look like and, and what the deliverables uh, should be. Clay? Yeah, um, I would say it should look, uh, it should definitely be built by XY advisor. I think that's a great start. Uh, the professional year by XY, I can, I can see that now. Um, <clears throat> so outcomes, you know, I would put sort of top of the list is, um, you know, becoming proficient in four types of silence. And then minoring on the other two. I feel like that, that it, I could spend a whole semester on that alone. Uh, but, but, but seriously, um, the, the, the deliverables, yeah, uh, sitting in a room and, and sitting next to um, an advisor who knows what they're talking about for a year is such a great idea. Um, I know me and you, we did that, Ben, um, at Dixon Advisory, uh, and it was, it was priceless. It was everything, right? Um, so that, that should definitely be a mandatory part of it, for sure. Awesome. And um, before I ask you, Adrian, just for the guys watching in, if anyone's got any questions, and I, I'm going to get to Jess or Jess's question in, in a sec uh, on this, but um, feel free to type them into the chat box on the, the Facebook live stream and, uh, and we're going to come to them very shortly. Adrian, your thoughts? Yeah, what Clay said is um, is pretty uh, spot on. Like you've got to be close to the action. 
So, um, and that's, it, it's, I guess it's how do you structure it? So it doesn't disrupt the business and it's, it's effective, like it's productive for the business in the way it's done. Um, but I think, I think there's a number of practices out there and, and some large ones that have done it really well. And it's probably just learning what's really worked for them in terms of transitioning people into, um, uh, into financial advice roles. But the, the other aspect I think that's really crucial that is the, the stand, I guess a bit of a benchmarking around what is taught because there's lots of different ways of doing everything. And I think that's, that's one of the, I guess one of the hardest things in the industry is that because it's so diverse, um, there's so many different ways of doing everything. And uh, you'd argue that there's quite a lot of practices out there that are um, conducted in advice practices that aren't really good to be passed on. So how do you put a, like, how do you help um, uh, protect that next generation of advisors? And if, if it's going to be like an official thing, how do you sort of, like, I'm not really, I don't want to advocate for more regulation, but like, how do you sort of yeah, put yeah, mechanisms in there that, that help um, help maintain that quality of what's being passed on? Yeah, and look, perhaps it could be that there's some sort of overarching, you know, competencies that have to be uh, sort of ticked off through, throughout because everyone's business is different, so you can't have a stock standard uh, approach to it. But more like, you know, what are, at the end of that year, what can the what can the person that's been through the professional year do? Your view, Naomi, as someone that's uh, sitting on the fence there? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I don't have a very strong, op stringent opinion of, of what's expected of advisors. Like you said, everyone does things differently. But um, I think you touched a little bit on mentors, and I think that might be an essential part. Um, when you are, especially when you're sitting at the top of your practice, if you're a practice owner, which a lot of you, you guys here are, um, it's hard to learn things on the job when you're at the top uh, often and i i'm not that i own the business i work for but no one sits above me in my field um and if it wasn't for me actually going out into the industry and seeking official mentors that are excelling in my role i wouldn't learn anything and i wouldn't get any better um uh i mean i could go to as many courses as i want and i and there is merit in that but um, but to have someone that you can actually go to and say, hey, what, what did you do when you went through this situation? Or I'm thinking about this. Um, how, how did you get through this? Or what do you think the best way is? And to just have that one person, not only to go to, to advice, but to keep you accountable to make sure they're pushing you along your development path of growth, um, I think is an essential part. Um, so that's probably where I would, I would see having um, there being a lot of value. So it's almost like people need a community where they can share ideas and learn <laughs> from each other. Is that what you're saying? It sounds like it's well worth CPD points, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of, couple of options, couple of options for, for the guys watching in on this. On oh, this look, time. I'm a little bit more subtle with my product placement than you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone who's kind of going to watch this video is already kind of, they already see the value of learning from other advisors. Um, it's more like, how do we, how do we talk to the majority of the industry who, you know, I had a conversation with one advisor yesterday. He was like, Oh, I really need, he's going to an AFA thing uh, in two weeks, the roadshow. And he's like, Oh, sometimes I don't get sent out my CBD points. I really need them because, and I was thinking to myself, like, it's not that hard to get CBD points. And so there are lots of advisors who just go through their business, run a really cracking business, but are just, you know, just want to hit their CBD points, just get their minimums so they can lodge it to their licensee. Um, so with a professional year and Patty did mention this, like our in industry is so fragmented in what we do. Like a financial planner could be someone who's all in on SMSF, doing direct shares, trading every day with their client's money, or it could be an insurance advisor who only sells income protection and that's all just income protection. So we've got such a fragmented industry. So to do a professional year with, you know, you know, the income protection only advisor and one with the SMSF who's doing direct shares, they're going to, come out at the end of the year with totally different experiences. So I guess, you know, I don't know, how do we, and, and I guess that's the issue with the whole education and why there is some, you know, diverse, you know, opinions on what should happen with the degree qualification. Cause I think everyone can kind of agree if you're doing holistic advice, then it's a no brainer. But if you're doing a really small portion 
of advice um, and you're really niched into one area, then to do a degree where majority is talking about investments is, is a bit harder. So, you know, how do we pre-vet, you know, the advisors who are going to take on, um, you, you know, the professional year grades? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's maybe a, a discussion to have with like an AFA and FBA. How do you pre-vet those advisors? But given that, the, that there's so much talk and we're running through all the things that are important for advisors and the things that we find important or valuable to us, what do you think are the, you know, um, the criteria that someone should be able to have? Because whether you're having, and I agree that it's different, but whether you're having an investment conversation or a coaching conversation or a life insurance conversation, then it sounds like a common theme. Everyone's saying these soft skills are, are important, right? So where's the element of client conversations in the professional year? Like it doesn't have to be you need to know about how to do a, you know, buy, sell, swap, trade thing or, you know, like it's, it's more about having that, you know, uh, the, the skills to be able to relate to clients and, uh, and, and, and engage them in, in the area that you're working in. Yeah, 100%. The professional year should really be, you know, as Clay said, making sure you hit, you know, the deliverables, making sure you hit X amount of meetings um, through that one year with with clients sitting alongside a practicing advisor. So you can see that if you're just doing the advisor's just doing income protection or they're doing you know the, the hardcore investment stuff, you're still getting that interaction with between advisor and client. Um, yeah, that you definitely need those kind of metrics. Maybe having an external party who just solely teaches those things as well on top of the so the degree is just all technical so an afa fba xy advisor um does that soft skill coaching um on top of that then yeah that's that's definitely valuable for that professional year great and that ties in with uh, with the point from jake who's watching uh through the facebook live stream that the you know perhaps a mentor could have been paid for um by the government and then you, you need to reach be of a certain standard to be able to to be a mentor i think that's a great yeah. idea because i think yeah What's that, Tomo? The government's not going to pay for that. It's well, just not- yeah, no, you're, you're probably right. But I think, you know, uh, Adrian mentioned before that there are some people that you that, that definitely should never teach any person how to be a financial advisor. <laughs> uh, and I how think you if you say, here's a, here's a professional year and you need to learn from your boss, well, you if you're, you know, uh, unlucky enough to get in, into a practice where, you know, you're you're with one of those people, then you won't know enough, and then and then it's uh, the cycle sort of continues. So, um, I think that having a benchmark around that, and then having it, you know, I think those the criteria, uh, certain amount of meetings, certain amount of uh, engagement. I think that's uh, that's a great idea. So, Nick, this uh, I was getting to that from a question from Jess or Jez, uh, who is watching in saying. Will you know what is what is this professional year about? So can you give us a a, a, a quick overview because we've only got three minutes left. Sure. So to, to uh, answer the question and kind of tie some of the the things together that you guys were talking about, what do we want out of it? I reckon it's about culture. Like we want the attitudes and the behaviours for the next generation of financial advisors to be right. Like the very reason we're having this conversation, right, is about instilling trust, growing consumer confidence, uh, growing the demand for financial advice. And so through a professional year, we can check stuff like the number of SOAs and we can, you know, we can check that stuff, right? But what do we really want it for? We want it for the culture. We want to get the right attitudes and behaviors within our profession. Because we've already got induction programs into licensees. You know, Clayton, you mentioned the Horizons program. We've already got things like CPD training programs. We've got exams. Um, We've got degrees. But why are we having this conversation? Like, it should be about growing the demand. And maybe if we rethink and redefine financial advisors, what we want to learn and to put into practice, people will actually start perceiving what we do in a different way. And, uh, and so, yeah, the professional year should be about um, getting those attitudes and behaviours right and about accelerating expertise. You can do it. Like there is ways, scientific proven ways, and people spend like, you know, 
kind of years thinking about how they actually scale this stuff. So whether or not the government pays, I don't know. But the question is a good one. How do we operationalize this and how do we create scale around it? Uh, and, you know, my answer to that question is we need to focus on the outcome. And it's not from what we want. It's actually want from the people who are not yet clients of a financial advisor. It's what they want. And we got this piece of research in, you know, 2013 that says that's what they value. You know, those attitudes and behaviors, the cultural bit. And that's kind of led us to this uh, next bit of research, which we currently have in the marketplace. We're undertaking... Uh, some research with Beddoes again, but also with Astron uh, and Kaplan to zero in on these attitudes and behaviours. And uh, the call to action, if I can, Ben, um, through yep, this. Yeah, I've got the link. I was just about to introduce. This is your moment to shine, Hakesy. Uh, sell the dream because we were chatting uh, and, and the AFA are doing, uh, I've signed up for it just because it sounded so interesting, but this collaborative learning approach, Hakesy will give us a spin in a sec, but um, they're wanting to get people to get their thoughts and, and use this to uh, to actually work through some of these challenges that we're facing and the changes that are coming up. So, Pagsy, go for it, mate. Yeah, so just really quickly, we've got such an important inflection point. And so why don't we build an industry-wide consensus view that uses science and properly proper evidence-based approach to form a consensus that we can feed into FASIA and go, this is what happens within an advice practice. And this is what the clients of financial advisors are saying that they value. And so this is not about the AFA saying that this is what should happen. This is about us collectively as a profession forming a consensus view and, and using that as a way to in, feed into elements like the professional year, like what we should actually teach people in a bachelor's degree what are the components of a registration exam that we should um, that we should test? What are the components of CPD? Should they evolve? Um, and so the call to action, if there's a link, that's cool. Um, there is I, would love, I would love to build, a, you know, an army of participants within the financial advice profession that share in this online consensus view, because the bit that we do all agree on is that education is a great, driver of building trust and confidence and growing the demand for financial advice. So jump onto the link. Yeah, absolutely. So the link's posted on the stream there. So, uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that it's clear on the, uh, on the, the panel, uh, on, on the Facebook group as well, but I'd encourage everyone to, to, to jump on that. I know from, I've been involved with the AFA for a number of years and they always ask for people's feedback and people rarely give it. Um, but I, I, and, you know, I think that everyone recognises or everyone should recognise that things do need to change. We need to be better uh, as a profession to do things like, you know, build the trust for, from consumers and be awesome. You know, we know that our clients love what we do. But if we can, you know, get more people doing that, uh, then it's just going to increase the demand for advice and more people will be telling their stories. And, you know, we wanted to get to the point where people will be shamed for not having an advisor because I think we all see the massive difference that it, that it makes to, in the lives of our clients. So um, jump on. It's actually really easy. As I said, I registered for it the other day um, because it would be great to get as many people to, to back like, and especially as many of the people in the XY community, because I know everyone's so passionate about it. So um, give your thoughts. It'd be great to, to go to Fazia with, with something really concrete with a loud voice uh, and, and actually shape these in the way that, that we think they should be. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Hey, see, I'll do, uh, I'll do the selling for you, mate. Um, yeah. Guys, thank you. Uh, happy birthday, Mr. Daniel. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, Thanks again to our mates at AIA for their support of this event. Sorry we have gone a little bit over time. I hope you enjoyed it. Any comments, this video is actually going to stay in stream uh, in Facebook, so feel free to throw them on there. I'm sure Nick will be jumping in and answering the questions as quickly as you can post them. Uh, so, uh, so get involved. And it will also be on YouTube and the uh, and podcast as well. Don't forget. Podcast. Yeah, podcast. Yeah. And Adrian, did you have something to say? Yeah, um, 
Pu really pumped for the XY Advisor social event next next week on Thursday, Thursday evening. So we're going to be streaming that Facebook live. Uh, so everyone's going to around Australia is going to be able to be a part of it. Um, yeah, hopefully we can pick up some of the questions off off that uh, like we do in in these sessions and um, get them out to the floor there. Um, and hopefully we don't yeah. need to watch it sideways. Like yeah, yeah, I think. I think we're gonna. It won't be too hard to beat that uh, last attempt at Facebook Live. <laughs> no. I won't be walking um, in front of the camera every five seconds either. So that should help. <laughs> but no, at the I same time, I'm I'm in charge of putting that together. So who knows what's going to happen? And um, yeah. there's going to be really good drinks up there for all the Brisbaneites that are attending. So um, yeah, it's our very first Brisbane event. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, Bernie Ripple's going to be down, and we've got some awesome advisors sharing some cool stuff about how they do it. We've got MC Fraser Jack. Um, busting his moves out there. Um, hopefully we get a bit of a dance floor going for him because he's, he's got some really good ones. And uh, yeah, it'll be, um, it'll be good fun. So get involved. We'll send out a link so everyone can put it um, in their calendar as well. So, um, so yeah, everyone in Brisbane would be great to have you there. The stream will be uh, up as well. So, uh, so you, can, you can watch it there if you're not local. Uh, big thank you, Mr. Hakes. Appreciate your uh, val very valuable time today. Uh, and it's been great to, uh, to, to dive a little deeper into this stuff. Cool. Thank you, guys. Much appreciated. Awesome. Thank you. See you next week. Yes. Bye, Cheers. Guys. Bye.